most popular sport on the planet is getting bigger and bigger and much richer and much costlier. Astronomical investments, inflated salaries, mega TV rights and commercial sponsors have turned it into a massive multinational multi-billion dollar industry. We sit down with the man at the helm of FIFA. We are a mirror of our world. To discuss the evolution of football. Everything has much more value when you're in the Premier League. From the home of the world's richest league, we follow the cash. And we ask, what price for the people's game? I am Marwan Bishara, and this is Empire. Football, a global obsession, the people's game, played by millions, watched by billions. It's more than just a sport, more than tournaments and trophies, more than big business. It's about politics and power. It's an engine of conflict, a force for change, transcending borders and cultural backgrounds, forging new affiliations and identities, appending the old us versus them equation. And it is changing fast. With new money pouring in, new markets just beginning to open up. To discuss how football is changing the world and the world is changing football, I am joined by Mina Rzuki, a writer and broadcaster well known for her reporting on Italian football for the British newspaper The Daily Mirror and for her analysis on television's world football show. Simon Cooper is a columnist for the Financial Times and the author of several books about football, including Suckernomics. Ashling O'Connor is sports news correspondent for the Times of London, covering issues as diverse as football finance and drugs in sports. She served as the paper's Olympics news correspondent. And last but not least, Jimmy Burns is a freelance journalist who specializes in Latin American and Spanish football, He's authored several sporting books, including his most recent, La Roja, A History of Spanish National Football. Aquero! 2012, Manchester City won the Premier League. The title-winning goal was scored by a player from Argentina who cost the club an eye-watering $40 million. The club is owned by Sheikh Zayed of Abu Dhabi, who is said to have pumped nearly a billion dollars into it. Earlier this year, the league signed broadcast deals worth some $4 billion. Once entirely British, today more than 60% of Premier League players come from overseas. Berbatov, Park. Colorful, cosmopolitan and flush with cash, the scene is a far cry from the dark ages of 30 years ago. The football ground of the late 1980s, there was a feeling of a lack of safety. So th there, were, there were tragic events related to safety, but there was also separately a, a hooliganism problem as well from the point of view of the clubs. It, it, it forced them to invest. That means they now have these great modern facilities that are very attractive for people to come along to, people feel safe coming to the game. You now see a much more mixed audience in terms of, in terms of gender, in terms of race. And so it's, it's a much more sort of open and inclusive environment for people to come to. Robert Murdoch has been a major player in globalizing the game. In 1992, he signed a satellite TV deal with the newly formed Premier League, putting some very big money in play. A whole new ball game. Everything has much more value when you're in the Premier League. American Andy Appleby is the chairman and co-owner of Derby County, who were knocked out of the Premier League in 2008, the same year Appleby bought them. You're guaranteed, uh, even if you just went up and came back down over the course of a year, uh, about 100 million pounds in contractually obligated revenue. Appleby's group bought the Rams for $100 million and has spent some 50 million more trying to earn the promotion to the Premier League. If you go around the world, it's the Premier League that you see, it's Premier League jerseys that you typically see, and those are the clubs that people are most interested in. As football teams soar in value, half of the Premier League is completely foreign-owned. Americans own five Premier League teams. 
Liverpool's owner, John Henry, has tried to convince fans he has their best interest, not his own wallet, at heart. Our ownership is not about profit. Contrary to popular opinion, owners rarely get involved in sports in order to generate cash. Some say the big money and American-style management have hurt the game. Football is becoming Americanized in terms of the relationship between team and fans, where fans are really treated uh, like third or fourth class citizens and there's not a lot of care given to what they think if they're able to afford the product. But there are upsides to the free flow of money and talent. The number one way football functions in a globalized environment is that coaches and players move as easily across national lines and national boundaries as capital and trade does. For example, countries that in Europe that have histories of racism or xenophobia accepting Muslim players or players of color and cheering for them on the field. As professional teams have integrated, so have many national teams. The rosters of England, France, and Germany are filled with players from former colonies or children of immigrants. But some argue that what's been good for Europe hasn't been good for the game elsewhere. In 2003, FIFA president Sepp Blatter said Europe's leading clubs conduct themselves increasingly as neo-colonialists who don't give a damn about heritage and culture, but engage in social and economic rape by robbing the developing world of its best players. Football's last 30 years have been an era of furious change. Some of it good, some not so good. But one thing is certain, change will continue. Where does football go from here? One organization which is in a position to influence the future of football is the Fédération Internationale de Football Association, or FIFA. It's the governing body of international football with more members than the United Nations, 209 and counting. And it's best known for organizing the World Cup. I caught up with FIFA's president, Sepp Blatter, in Zurich and asked him about the role of money in football. The danger that we are facing actually uh, is uh, that uh, with the um, creation of big leagues and big competition, club competitions, uh, the focus of football is more than on professional football and professional leagues. Uh, and we, from time to time, uh, it gives the impression that we forgot uh, that uh, football uh, has to be played everywhere in the world. Mm. We need also this, uh, in, at the top of the pyramid, for the promotion of football, we need the stars, we need, uh, we, we need the competition. And we have to find out uh, the right balance uh, between this uh, uh, high uh, professional artistic football and then uh, the, the, the football at school level, the football in the localities, in uh, the small communities uh, where uh, uh, parents, they go to, the, to the accompanying their boys or girls when they play football. And here we have to find the right balance. But how are you as FIFA leveling the playing field between the new mega rich influential superior clubs and the rest of the football teams. And well, it, 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 is, it is evident that there is now a gap. There is a gap between the rich and those they have less. But they're increasing uh, gap. It's a deepening yeah, gap. It's, it, is, it is a gap. It, the, the gap is increasing. Uh, this is, but only in club football. On the other side, because in the club football you use players from all around the world, and these players, they go back to play with their national teams, so the gap between the best in the national team and the others is going narrow now. Yes. It's closer to cl closer, but in the club competition, the, the, it, it's going away. It's going away because uh, there is a saying, on the prêt corriche, it means we, you give only money to those they already are rich. Yes. And, uh, and therefore, the rich clubs, they have the possibilities uh, to buy the, the best players and to have the best players. Aren't you worried from the competition between the big mega club and the national teams, from the private multi-national corporations called clubs and your national teams? As long as there is an understanding uh, between the uh, pyramid, pyramidal organization of FIFA, where the members are the national associations, mm. and the national associations with their leagues, 
if they can work in harmony, it means then to bring together the interests of the club football with the interest of uh, uh, the national teams. Are you are you fine? Are you okay with this huge influx of money by disinterested people in football into the football clubs? Well, as long as long as they, they put the money in the in in the football club instead of putting somewhere well uh, somewhere else, uh, I am in favor of that mm. uh, that they do it because uh, uh, I, I say football is entertainment. Football is emotions, and uh, that that's good. But. Uh, there must be some control. If there is no control, uh, then at the end, at the end, you will have only uh, a few. Who's going to put the control? Sorry. Who's going to put the control in place? It must be done by the national associations, which is which is your members. This is our members, and in the competitions, those they organize the competitions, and that's why UEFA started with the the Champions League mm -hmm. and with the Europa League. Uh, they uh, have installed now this. Uh, financial fair play to make the control. The organizer of the competition must control it as we do it with the World Cup, as we do it with all other FIFA competitions. You know, paradoxically, uh, Mr. President, uh, you speak about the Wild West sort of uh, free market in football. At the same time, paradoxically, it's in the United States where they put cap on the earnings of the players. And I think one of the major problems here is that there is no caps on the earnings of the players or the agents or the exchange of players um, among the clubs. In the USA, it's a totally uh, um, different organization of professional sport yes. uh, because they have leagues. They have the major leagues and, and the, uh, the minor leagues and they want to make sure that there is a competition. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, at the beginning of a season, they draft the players and they put the players in all the teams in order that uh, they have a leveling the uh, field, a le le a levering, and then with salary caps. Yeah. But you cannot do it in a, in the free economy. And in, in Europe, uh, the, uh, the the sport, if they would come in with such an idea, they would be immediately, immediately uh, killed, not killed, but uh, yes. but uh, uh, then destroyed uh, by the European Union reg regulations. And the European Union regulations also allow uh, all this flu of uh, of uh, players, foreigners can play where everywhere. It's uh, it's not any longer only national players are playing in a league. Ashling, Simon, Mina, Jimmy, welcome to Empire. First impressions, Simon. What do you think of what Blatter said? I'm wondering what the problem is that we're trying to solve. I mean, football is hugely popular. More people around the world watch it than ever before. So why are we worried about the fact that there are a lot of foreigners playing and that rich people own the clubs? Where is the problem? Not to blow my own trumpet, but I wrote a book, Soconomics, with a sports economist, and we said, do fans actually mind that big clubs are much stronger than small clubs? So Manchester United almost always beat Wigan. And we found that fans are fine with that, partly because more people support Manchester United, Wigan fans are used to losing. The fact that the big clubs are getting bigger doesn't seem to be putting people off. People vote with their feet, and where are they there in the stadium or watching TV? Well, the, the problem is that Mr. Blatter can't control it. That's, that's, that's all, all, yeah. all it comes down to is who owns this growth. And the clubs have got themselves together. They've uh, you know, done deals with broadcasters that have brought in billions of, billions of dollars that they've invested not only in players but also in facilities, and they're packing them out every week. Uh, Jimmy, the fact that uh, there are so much disparities among various clubs, among certainly the, the clubs in Europe and, and, and maybe parts of Latin America and the rest. The fact that it's almost predictable who's going to be winning uh, championships. The fact that 20 clubs now are far uh, bigger and more important and play better than all the rest. Is that disturbing to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to disagree with these two. I mean, I, I, I am sort of worried, like, like Brasher is about this sort of a uh, yawning gap between uh, between the rich and the poor. I mean, I follow um, Spanish football a lot, and, and uh, I mean, it's self-evident there that uh, the kind of uh, trend you've seen over the last sort of uh, five or ten years is, is almost a sort of duopoly developing uh, among two major clubs, Real Madrid and, and Barcelona, um, almost to the detriment 
uh, of all the other clubs. And, and I think that's a pity because that, that sort of leads to a kind of gradual erosion of, of local cultural identities. Um, and not to speak about the, the, the control uh, that both Real Madrid and Barca have on TV rights, of course. It's, you call it the yawning gap? I would call it a yawning gap, yeah. Well, yawning. You have to let it yawn up to a certain point. And you can have some disparities. So Manchester United usually beat Wigan, but sometimes Wigan win. In Spain, they've let it get too far because the TV rights virtually all go to Barcelona and Real Madrid. Nobody else gets a look in. In England, the division is much more equal. So in Spain, they've got the disparity let go to the point where you pretty much know every weekend that Barcelona and Real Madrid will win their matches. But that's what the trend people, is now. The trend well, is in, towards, in England, that, they towards limit, that gap. In England, they limit that due to collectivization of TV rights. So uh, we can get a fair bit of... But money. now more teams are asking for independent t TV rights. Well, why would you? Because under the, the, the next Premier League deal, which it, the domestic light rights alone, £3 billion, pounds, if you finish uh, last in the Premier League, you're guaranteed income broadcasting income is going to be about 100 million pounds i'm not sure what the the, the last team in in the, in spanish uh, first division could, could expect peanuts compared to what real madrid and uh, and barca get i mean i i think they're absolutely right there's a, there's a huge difference between the premier league and la liga and, and of course a lot of, of smaller clubs in la liga look to the premier league as an example of what really should happen in spain but i think if you're going to encourage young kids in particular um, from smaller villages and smaller towns um, you can't expect them simply to go through the sort of very competitive treadmill that you need to go through to get to a team like Barcelona or Real Madrid. It's got to be a much more level playing field, a much more open one. Well, the thing is, is that I just find that the great message that is being sent out at the moment is the fact that if you do have money and if you can just chuck it all in in a club, then that will succeed. I mean, this is meant to be the beautiful game that reaches every single person. So what kind of message is that sending to people who don't have access to watch these great leagues or, or to actually visit them. Then you have the case of Rayo Vallecano, and it's like they can't, they can't even afford to go on the away trips. I mean, they, they're not even allowed to take the, the roads that you have to pay a toll for because they don't have the money to do that. Whereas, meanwhile, Barcelona is investing in, what, 100 million pound talents, you know? Ronaldo's 90 million pound cost for Real Madrid was made up in several weeks just from commercial. And no one can afford that except a few clubs in e the world. Except for a few clubs. There's something to be said about, you know, supporting smaller clubs, Rayo Vallecano, and knowing that maybe somewhere along the line they have a chance of doing something exciting and being able to say that this is a you know, football world for everyone. But certainly now the transfer of players is, is, a, is a one way uh, Yeah, the stream. big clubs buy all the players. But then... And so now Latin America is losing its players, Africa is losing its players, and everything is concentrated up there in the north, around here in Europe. Yeah, it's been going on for a while, though you're now getting Contra flows as the global economy moves away from the West. You're now getting the Brazilian League as one of the world's richest leagues. Uh, you have Russia, China, Gulf countries that have as much money as the top clubs here. The top clubs here have the additional lure that everybody wants to play in the most historic leagues which are here. So I don't think but that the, the big investment is still flowing to Europe. Brazilian league is going to be, I think, pretty much richer than the Italian league. Mexican league as well, you can often earn as much as a Premier League player. So I'm saying there's a lot of leagues around the world outside Western Europe where the pay is huge. Uh, yeah, but self-evidently, you know, I mean, you're missing the main point there. Is that your exposure is, um, I mean, in terms of commercial rights and sponsorship is nowhere near what you're going to get in the Premier League or in La Liga. I mean, it's self-evident that you, you have got a, 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 a disproportionate one-way flow going from the developing world uh, to, to the developed world. Take Argentina, for instance. I mean, Argentine clubs just cannot hang on to, to their talent. They just can't pay for them. And, and look at all the Argentines playing for, for Spanish clubs and, 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 and in the Premier League. The difficulties Argentina have had uh, in forming a, 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 an identity as a national team that can form a system of play, that can have a certain solidarity among them, is precisely because they got their best players uh, in a totally different environment, getting paid much more than their colleagues back home. And uh, uh, Ashling, are you optimistic about uh, the proliferation of football in places like China and, and other places now? I think it's going to take time. It's going to be a, a, there's going to be a lot of sort of uh, you know, has been retired players going over there earning lots of money. You know, do the Chinese want to watch uh, the Premier League or Serie A or La Liga over their local leagues? Yes, now they do. But I want to go back to Mina's point about uh, the, how, the, how the game is becoming so money dependent. And, and, and since it's so monopolized, as Jimmy said, up there in the north, 
it's also standardizing the game in a way that's perhaps even far more boring than before in the sense that there is a certain way of playing and certain people that are paying, certain investments that are taking place, and hence we have this model from the north that's just being more or less dominant throughout the world. There's only one way to play good football. It's very European style. It's collective, that it's sounds fast Dutch. moving, it's physical, it's Dutch. <laughs> Dutch passing, German power, Italian defending. It's a very European style that works, and so the Brazilian style didn't work. And, um, what do you mean the Brazilian so stuff didn't work? Didn't work for who? For what? Uh, slow dribbling, you get the ball, you stand still, doesn't work, you don't win. Do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with that. But that, that's also because I don't. I think natural evolution has changed things. Italians can't really defend anymore, and perhaps you know different leagues are coming out. Before Champions League, you saw it, the winners mainly controlling the ball and that type of game, whereas now it's about collective energy. So philosophies are changing. Evolution is changing all that. And back again to the question of money and being money dependent and the power now of money and all of this. Certainly the model is not between being poor and being rich. The Germans certainly is one example of those who are being creating a certain system whereby still there is certain accountability to the fans or to support the members. But they have a, a, you know, Germany has a history, a sporting club, local sporting club history that we probably doesn't, apart from France, I, mean, it's, I think it's not replicated anywhere else in Europe. Well, here at the home of football, there is a certain tradition. No, I mean, to but you know, like a multi-sport club where you you know yeah. you follow the local basketball team and the local football team and the local ice hockey team, and um, and and you wouldn't do anything else. So now it's the British comp it's the British model that is dominating, not the German one, I guess. Well, I mean, the Bundesliga is not not watched hugely outside of uh, outside of Germany, apart from. When the, the, those clubs get thanks out into, in, get out into the into the Champions yeah. League, but they're all you know, they're not necessarily thanks to money. They've taken a, a way of doing it um, to, to make their clubs self-sustaining in order to make it affordable for local people to go. But they're they're not interested in it being the, the world's most watched league. Jimmy, are you worried? For once, I'm I'm beginning to agree with Simon. Actually, I mean, I that's not but a good I, sign. <laughs> you, you keep moving the, the goalposts. As Ball well. <laughs> I mean, I certainly agree that the kind of trend of beautiful football is definitely coming from the Dutch, going to the Spanish, uh, and that's the kind of you know the Barca way of playing, the play, the way La Roja play, is the beautiful game now. Uh, but I also agree with Mina that that I think what keeps the game going and makes it really interesting is that it's not exclusive. Uh, the day when we all play the same and we go and see all clubs playing the same, that's the end of the game. What, one last point just on this before we take a news break. Uh, Mina, the idea that this, there was set in this uh, kind of holy almost uh, triangle between fans, managers and, and, and players, and now suddenly this investment element, this fourth dimension is coming in. How does that work out that new owners can hire managers, kick managers out and so on and so forth? What does that mean to the stability or to the sustainability of the game? Well, this is the thing, you know, I mean, the Premier League is symbolic of the wider free market that England represents. So, you know, you are allowed to purchase. Everything is, is available to be bought. And I guess while everyone looks to the Premier League as an example, I think people should look to the Bundesliga as that example. You know, the fans have a say with how much ticket prices are growing. In the Premier League, they've just grown, they've gone up by four pounds on average since last year. Whereas at least, you know, you have in Germany, you're allowed to say this is getting too much. Well, we're going to get to that and to the merchandising bit of it all. But uh, it's time for a quick news break. When we come back, we'll be looking at what can happen when football and politics collide and coincide. Welcome back with my guests, Mina Arzuki, Simon Cooper, Ashling O'Connor, and Jimmy Burns. We've spoken a lot about the new political economy of global football, about the money, the branding, and star power. But at its heart, football is a combative and competitive sport of proximity it inflames the souls, hardens loyalties, and brings out the most basic human instincts. It underscores nationalist, ethnic, and religious populisms, and yes, racism and other prejudices. And yet, we've also seen football bring out the best in people, camaraderie, affinity, and philanthropy, amongst others. In a moment, we'll hear from FIFA's president, Sepp Blatter, but first, not only has football reflected societal change, it has also helped mold social and political change and even mount a revolution as we've seen in Egypt. They've been called the foot soldiers of the revolution. Die-hard football fans, Egypt's ultras, 
were on the front lines of the uprising that toppled Hosni Mubarak two years ago. That was just the beginning. They called for the overthrow of the military regime that succeeded Mubarak and led massive protests against it. Now, the ultras may be poised to strike again, this time against the current government, ruled by a president from the Muslim Brotherhood. They're die-hard football fans and they, they would defend their team, they would defend football for anything. But now it's not just their team and it's not just football, it's the revolution. One club has dominated Egyptian football for nearly 100 years, Al Ahli. Africa's most decorated team boasts an estimated 50 million supporters and the continent's most famous fan association. Under Mubarak, Ultras Ahlawi often clashed with the police, but they were apolitical. That is, until the Arab Spring swept through Egypt. When you hear that the, the Ultras March is coming, you just, like, you feel delighted, because you know that the square is going to get full. The Ultras quickly came to be known as the protectors of their less experienced fellow revolutionaries, especially women. You always have problems of sexual harassment and uh, and things like that. Uh, but ultras really take care of that. Like They really know how to protect women and they know how to protect anything. Thousands of ultras joined the revolution as individuals, but not officially, a club policy that continued under the generals who took over after Mubarak. But after a 19-year-old ultra was killed in a protest in late 2011, for the first time, the ultras called for the ousting of the military council during a nationally televised match. The chants weren't just embarrassing, they were threatening. There isn't one Egyptian that's not a football fan, and most of them are Ahli fans. Four days later, suspect thugs masquerading as rival fans stormed the stands following a match in the city of Port Said. 72 ultras were killed and hundreds injured, including children. Police stood by as ultras were stabbed, choked to death, thrown from the bleachers and trampled. The ultras accused the government of orchestrating the attack. Cairo erupted in violence. Revolutionary singer Rami Assam became a fixture in the ultras protests and wrote two songs about the Port Said massacre. Long maligned by the Egyptian state media, the ultras gained the sympathy of millions of Egyptians. They organized matches and formed sit-ins joined by thousands of activists and ordinary citizens. Even the rival ultras from Al Ahli's arch nemesis, Zamalek Sport Club, joined in the demonstrations, fighting side by side with them against the police and supporting their demands for justice. They became part of the revolution. They're not just ultras now, they're revolutionaries. Organized, disciplined, fearless, fiercely loyal and battle-proven, the ultras have become the face of the young people who until this day are in Egypt's streets demanding the change they feel the revolution promised but never delivered. The aim of FIFA is not only to develop this game and to organize competition, but uh, uh, to try to make a little bit, a little bit, a better world. In, the, in our perturbed world we are living now, football brings emotions and hope. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that today in Syria and in Afghanistan they play football? They play mm -hmm. organized football, it's played there. With all the difficulties, uh, we play women's football in uh, Palestine. 
so I, uh, it's f football is connecting people and bringing emotion and, and uh, hope into our world. And one of the small news items I've read recently is your Secretary General said that they will be building the next uh, football stadium in Gaza that was uh, destroyed in the, in the recent bombings, for example. That sounds like a, one of your development. This uh, uh, football field in Gaza uh, has already been bombed once. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, we have reinstalled it. We, it was in 2008, I think. Yeah. We have reinstalled it, and with the help of other federations yeah. like uh, Saudi Arabia. Right. Saudi Arabia has given some money that to, to have a small stadium installed mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And now it is destroyed again. Mm -hmm. And we will do it again, together with the help of the others. Part of the disparities is not only just rich and poor in general, but also between North and South. Your organization is trying to help uh, bring football to the South and worldwide. How is that, how is that happening? The, the best players, when we play uh, Africa, the best players, they are aspired uh, by the, the, uh, uh, the other, uh, the, the big clubs. Uh, Again, because, in the North? Uh, in the North, because they want, they, they want to go there and to, to make a better living. That's, that's normal. But you uh, criticized that in the past. You thought that was buying young people no but anyway future. I, but anyway I, I criticize that because this is this is uh, uh, we have to protect the youth and we have now uh, regulations that, uh, that they do not permit uh, the transfer of players before the age of 18 mm. uh, we started to help national associations to install professional leagues mm. in Africa in the south as you say mm. in order uh, that uh, they um, could uh, uh, earn their living by staying in the country and not trying to go out because of 100 Africans going to uh, Europe they are 10 not more than 10 percent they are doing very well it is creating because of the proximity um, uh, certain racism as you know that's becoming pervasive in certain leagues or among certain audiences and fans in Europe and elsewhere how what are you doing about the question of racism discrimination is not in our game discrimination is in the world we are a mirror of our world in football and you have uh, discrimination and you have racism in football we are fighting against that but again it can only be by solidarity by solidarity. But, but you and football are showing the way, for example, France in 1998. In a number of uh, clubs now, the, the multinationality, the diversity of national teams is showing a good face of these yeah, nations. Sure, sure. But you cannot avoid that somewhere people, they don't be, uh, behave uh, the educational way. There is zero tolerance in discrimination and racism. And in, in the game, you cannot tolerate that. Uh, football for all. How about women? Are you optimistic about football becoming not just a, a men's club, but more and more well, becoming uh, more? The, the future of football will be feminine. And uh, we have uh, shown that now all around the world, uh, girls and women can play football. We had a wonderful example uh, for the under 17, which was played in Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. For the first time, we have organized a women's competition in an Islamic country. Are you optimistic about the future of football in places like China and the US? Well, uh, in China, definitely, uh, we have no problems for the future of football. It's only a question of organization. Uh, the, the problem in the United States is a little bit different. Uh, the, uh, the, there is no very strong professional league. They have just the MLS, but they have not the, these uh, professional leagues which are recognized by the American society. It is a question of time. Well, Simon, one of the... Uh I guess, advantages of globalization of football uh, is that those nationalist lines among teams and fans uh, is kind of fading away towards new affinities with clubs. And, but yet within the clubs, because we have this diversity of culture, ethnicity, and nationality, it is creating a certain racism of proximity, if you will, especially in Europe. In England, we've had a couple of big scandals about racist comments made on the field by uh, Luis Suarez, by John Terry in the last year. And I think that doesn't show that there's an increase in racism. Rather, I think what those incidents have shown is that there's a crackdown on racism in England, certainly, not in many other leagues. I would say in Spain, it's lagging somewhat. 
He says, uh, Seb Blatter says there's zero tolerance for racism. That's not true. There's quite a bit of tolerance for racism. He, he said also, Blatter, that um, football in so many ways mirrors the world. We were just speaking earlier that just when the world is going towards more so-called good global governance and welfare states and a bit of uh, state intervention, football is taking a completely different uh, direction, becoming far more neoliberal, far more free hand, so-called laissez-faire, and, and so on and so forth. Do you mean reflected by the fact that anyone can buy a club and do what Anywhere. they want with it? It's become greedier, perhaps, in, in certain circumstances, but how can you stop a rich man buying a club, putting money in it, and doing what he wants with it? The, the thing is, just as we said on the top, just as it becomes richer, football is also becoming costlier. I, I think, you know, this, this, this question of to what extent the, the sort of you know, the, the, the money factor, and it keeps coming back to this money factor. I, I think that um, what, what the crisis is, is doing is, is forcing even the bigger clubs uh, to think more imaginatively. Um, I mean, say, take a, a, a club like Barca. It's, 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 it's clear that with the debt it's been carrying over the last two or three years, that it couldn't, you know, lash out on, on big transfers. Real Madrid is coming round to that belatedly. But, you know, the, 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 the positive side of that is that Barca has developed a very successful youth academy. Um, and thinking of that, actually, I was struck by Bratter's comment, and, and I tend to agree with Ashley. This is where I begin to get a bit nervous about FIFA world control. I mean, this idea of, of stopping Africans coming over till the age of 18. I mean, look at Messi. He came to Barca at the age of 13. I mean, are we going to start saying to future or messes, you know, don't come over till you're 18. You need a club coming around him like a family and developing him as an individual. And quite frankly, I think he's going to have a better chance in Europe than he's going to have in, in, in Africa or in, in, uh, in Latin America as things stand at the moment. So, Mina, money, globalization and so on, we talked about the, the disadvantages, but certainly it's bringing football to more parts of the world and it's certainly bringing football to women Unlike before, it's no longer a private men's club. Do you see those advantages now materializing? Bringing it to women, I think, you know, for one thing, the Olympics helped with that a lot because there was a lot of attention focused on women's football. Do I think that it's the future? I think it's a long way to go before that will ever be the future. If it's bringing it to different countries, Yes and no, because, you know, predominantly, no matter how much we think about it, football is still really dominated by these European countries, you know, e even as much as, for example, now you had Zenit St. Petersburg spend 60 million in the transfer market. You know, at the end of the day, they still they still only qualified for the Europa League. There's still that kind of element of you can buy and buy. But at the end of the day, great footballers want to play for Barcelona. They want to play for for Bayern Munich because that's the name that they want to go to. So China, yes, it's great. You can, you know, you can get your Didier Drogba, but he's still trying to seek a, a move back. I'm, I'm not sure whether really it's, it's global, as much globalization as we would like it to be. No, I, mean, I, mean, I agree with Mina that the Chinese, the Russian leagues, et cetera, they're going to take a very, very long time before they're attractive. But what I think we have seen in the last 10, 15 years is this revolutionary spread of football to all sorts of countries where people were barely aware of it. Between 1993 and 96, Japan, India, China, and the US all founded national professional leagues. But football has reached, whether they consume the local game or the global game, has reached maybe billions more people than it did 20 years ago. That's thanks to television and the internet. You, you don't agree that uh, FIFA granting a certain country the rights for the World Cup, that helps spread football in that region or in that country? Is South Africa a better place for hosting the World Cup? They were expecting, I think, 450,000 visitors. They got 300,000. Yeah, that, uh, they initially expected something like 700,000 was the initial wild estimates. It would give the economy this boost worth billions. It's been an economic disaster. But FIFA makes a lot Africa. of money. Do these yeah, countries FIFA, make FIFA a lot of money? money? No, South Africa had to spend to host the tournament. Three and, and, and a half billion or something. The broadcasting receipts go to FIFA. So FIFA get the money and the host country get the costs. It was a scandal. It was a crime perpetrated by the South African government, which also told these lies about an economic boost, and by FIFA in cohorts, uh, in cahoots, in a country where many people don't have a roof over their heads. But it's Speaking all sold on the back of a, pol a political message that, this, that football would make it a better place, that, yeah. you know, that, we, that we heard Mr. Mr. Slatter say. We, well, I mean, I do, you know, you, uh, and Mina will probably know more than I do about uh, the, the, the kind of, what kind of impact will a World Cup in Qatar 
have on developing football in that host nation is probably quite minimal. But it, w will there be a ripple effect that would be worth, take, the region. worth in, taking it to the region? I mean, will, will football, for example, World Cup in Qatar in 2022, will that help spread football around in the Arab world? Or well, the thing it? with the Arab world and football is that there is this, you know, this line that it takes, I guess, with political identification. You know, these countries are very much oppressed by a dictatorship, or at least were. And, um, and without organized societies and, and, and a place just to voice your opinion, you end up sort of becoming a football fan and you take your stand there. Are you pro the regime that is in place or anti the regime that is in place? Um, so football, as much as it is a sport, it's more of a political line. Yes, everyone wants to go see it, but it, it's, it's, there's an identification. You'll find that most people who support Al Ahli, for example, in Egypt, don't necessarily like the national team because at the time it was very much associated to Mubarak and the fact he wrapped himself up with the Egyptian flag all the time. Football has always been huge, even in Iraq. You know, I mean, they won 2007 Asian Cup when, at a time when they thought they lost their country. So it was great because it united a, a a country that was very divided, but what's that going to do for them in the future? The, the, I mean, the use of uh, the use of football by dictators have been is quite yeah, rife everywhere <laughs> in the world. You think FIFA should be doing anything about that sort of exploitation of football for unsavory political ends? I'm very against you know sport of any kind being used. Uh, to maintain regimes in power. We've seen in the past this happening. I mean, the clearest example of that was the World Cup in 1978, in uh, which FIFA uh, backed to the hilt uh, under Havaraj, Blatter's uh, predecessor. Um, it should never have taken place. I mean, there were people being tortured and killed at 200 meters away from the River Plate Stadium, uh, with, with, with everyone cheering the Argentine squad on and the military junta there. It was an absolute disgrace. And FIFA gave its blessing from start to to finish on that. That should never happen again. What's amazing is if you look at e each and every dictatorship in the Arab world, uh, from Gaddafi's to Saddam Hussein's and from Egypt uh, to Syria, you'll see that the, the dictator junior, the, the son of the dictator, is the one in charge of the football team yes. in the Football Association. Well, that happened with Iraq because in 1984, you know, it was no longer separate sport and politics. That was when it was turned over to Adey Hussein. And he took over and obviously he started making them train with a concrete ball. Um, and inflicted all his torture on it. But I think that that's quite a European model as well. We forget how much, you know, General Franco obviously affected Spanish football. Mussolini, well, in one direction, you could say he created football for the Italians. He, well, he let, let's say he gave it the, the necessary hype. He made it the number one sport to watch in Italy. And he built all the stadiums that are still, unfortunately, council-owned. Mussolini started it, you know, with this fascist regime. And then everyone started to see that when you hold politics, it's a great advantage, perhaps. You know, you could see how Berlusconi used that to, to rally around and gather support. But that is very much a European model that perhaps spilled over everywhere else. I, I just wanted to, to, to bring back the, the discussion, and it, it, it sort of dovetails what we're talking about the, to the ultras uh, and, and the clip of the Egyptian film, because my experience, and, and I'm sure Mina's experience of Italy, uh, of the ultras uh, in Italian and Spanish clubs is, is generally very negative. I mean, the, the ultras are, in a sense, we're talking about political extremes. It's, it's the most negative political extremes. And it brings out really the worst in, in fans. And it goes back to this issue of racism. I mean, when you have racism, I, can, I agree with, uh, with, with Simon. I mean, ra racism, stamping out racism in Spain is, is way behind uh, the Premier League. Why? Because immigration in Spain is, 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 is pretty uh, belated. I mean, it's come to Spain later than England and Spain, Spanish society is still coming to terms with the multicultural society. You, you followed the, uh, the Egypt uh uh, situation uh, are the ultras in in Egypt then giving a different model of what a football fan can be? I think what's in a dictatorial society often the one place where you can shout what you want and unite in a group with other like-minded people is the football club and the football stadium it's the one free space and what you saw in Egypt is the dictator always tries to monopolize violence himself and his security forces and about the only force in Egypt outside the regime that also had violence were the football ultras and so when you have a revolution, it's very handy if, as well as the liberal and socialist people on Tahrir Square asking for a better Egypt, you have some violence. Violence is always useful in a revolution. And so the ultras added the violence to the revolution that was necessary, it seems, to unseat Mubarak. And in 20 years of looking at connections between football and politics, 
Egypt in 2011 to me is the most spectacular case of football actually changing a country. There, it's very hard to find any other examples on that. Scale. Do you think that's an exception? Yes, very much so. To the rule, or you think we'll see more and more that type of model? I don't know. Now we're talking about how in Algeria there are certain worries about, I mean, from the regime that. The authors are, more, yeah. are taking the inspiration from Egypt. The regimes are very worried often about football fans because, I mean, you've seen in Iran in recent years when the Iranian team wins, millions of people spill out onto the streets. Often they end up shouting anti-regime slogans, fighting with security forces. So football is this very powerful force that regimes are worried about. In Libya, about. actually, they blocked the stadium. They closed them down during the revolution. And about the only anti-Gaddafi demonstration in the previous years was 1996, huge fight in a football stadium shooting between the Gaddafi team and other people. So football, yes, I mean, as Mina was saying, Politicians from Mussolini have tried to hug it close, but football can also bite them in the ankle sometimes, and Egypt's the most spectacular example. I think Egypt also is, is quite a different example in the case, and I'm not sure that that will happen again, because in, in Egypt you have 25% of the population is between the age of 18 and 29, um, and this is, and 51% of, the, of those people are living in abject poverty. So it is the only way that you can organize mass youths to just go and fight for their future of their country. And of course, what better way to do it than by using sport? But I'm not sure that you have those kind of statistics in any other country where you can push that further. Well, on this wondering question, Mina, Jimmy, Ashling and Simon, thank you for joining Empire. <laughs> and I'll be back with a final thought. I disagree with FIFA's president. Football isn't and can't be totally apolitical. Certainly playing or watching the beautiful game is a great pleasure, passion, and even obsession for countless people. It takes them away from the preoccupations of real life and its hardships. But just as football provides a break from the realities of the world, the world just won't give it a break. Like with FIFA, its politics and finance affect each and every aspect of how international football is organized and played. That's why democratizing the game by leveling the playing field among football clubs is indispensable for the well-being and excitement of the game. Likewise, those who use the game as a political football, exploiting it for unsavory political ends, let alone bombing stadiums and imprisoning players, should be held accountable. It all boils down to people's choices, and in this case, you, the fans. If football is to be the great global unifier, it's up to the people to reclaim the people's game. And that's the way it goes. Until next time.